like to ask you to do a little bit of thinking today, because today we're really going to be talking about concept generation. Which, if you think about it, it shouldn't be that hard, right? Because what's a concept? It's an idea. You have ideas all the time, right? Concept generation means to have more ideas. I mean, how hard could that possibly be, right? I guess ultimately, why would you want to have concepts in the first place? Solve problems. Solve problems, right? Well, can't you just have an idea, figure out how to solve it, implement it, and be done with it? But sometimes if you think of one idea, and if you think of one idea, you can either add another idea, or take a look at that one and apply that one. You can also get tunnel vision. You get tunnel vision. Right. So, and I guess it is it possible that if you had a whole bunch of ideas, a whole bunch of concepts, they could all actually produce a working solution, right? Unless they're bad ideas. Well, they could be bad ideas. Okay, so, oh, that's even worse. So you'll have some good ideas and you'll have some bad ideas? Probably. Well, that sort of sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. How are you going to tell the difference? Maybe the next step. <laughs> you know, so, right? But, you know, so that's sort of tough. Good ideas, bad ideas. That's two buckets, right? Would you argue that maybe there's three buckets? So there's good ideas and bad ideas, but even in your good ideas, there's like better ideas, right? So you might have a solution that's going to cost a million dollars, and you might have a solution that's going to cost a hundred dollars. And they're both producing workable solutions, right? But if you've only got a hundred dollars, there's only one that you can use, right? So the challenge here is that, you know, congratulations. You're overflowing with fantastic creativity. You can come up with great ideas. It's a matter of selecting between them, picking the right one. You pick the wrong one, congratulations, you lose. The company goes out of business, and uh, you got to go find a new job, right? So maybe we should talk about this, figure out how we do this. All right, got a question for you. Got a picture of a gentleman here. What's his favorite football team? The Bears. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very interesting. And why do you say that? It's my team. Well, okay, so fundamentally, everybody's a Bears fan because it's your team. It should be. But why would you say this gentleman's favorite team is the Bears? Because he's glossing. He's wearing a, a jacket with the Bears logo on it, right? Yeah, but he's obviously modeling, so it's not like his jacket. Actually, it was on sale at the Phoenix man. Could he have borrowed, <laughs> could he have borrowed the jacket from somebody? Yeah, it was cold outside. It's from one with the... Exactly, right? Blues is the cheapest one. Oh, by the way, he's a model, so maybe he just got the jacket, right? Great photo shoot here, take the jacket, right? So you sort of jumped to a conclusion there, right? I thought he was a technical professional on Casual Friday. And he could be. Yeah, I mean, you might be right. Would you also grant that you might be wrong? Absolutely. Okay, so it's always possible, right? So that's one of the key things you want to understand here, because the solution to my question looked pretty obvious. Of course. He's a bear's friend, right? But what you need to understand is that there might be extenuating circumstances. There might be additional information that you don't have that means that that particular solution is wrong. Hmm. So, right, so I'm just to consider. All right. Let's see how smart you really are. You think you're smart. In fact, you know the answer to this. Shut up. I don't want to hear about it. But if you don't, let's see if we can do it. I got, I'll, I got nine dots here. It can't be that hard. It's only nine dots, OK? okay. What I want you to do, whip out a pencil, whip out a pencil, whatever you want to do, I want you to draw four straight lines, which go through the middle of all the dots. You cannot take your pencil off the paper. Okay? You can start from any position and draw the lines one after another without taking your pencil off the paper. I mean, it's four freaking lines. This cannot be that hard. Not five lines, not six lines, just four lines. Ms. Poole, you're just sitting there because you know the answer? That's not fair. I'll get you later. Don't worry. <coughs> missed one, man. <laughs> See? So somebody just said you missed one. And that's what happens. If you your first shot at this, you're probably going to have one circle you don't go through. It's pretty easy to do, except for that pesky one circle. So go back and redo it. Give it another shot. Generally what happens the second time you go through is you're Yeah, that's what it is. Generally what happens is you do it again and there's a different circle that you miss. Okay? It's not a terribly hard problem, but the concept is, is we want to tap into your creativity. Oh, by the way, I'm making a super thick line. <laughs> that just goes off. That doesn't work that much. Good try. Just a little challenge for the next time you get together with the family and you want to stumble. 
show them that the investment that they're making in your continuing education is well worth it because you can solve the nine dot problem. Which actually, come to think of it, because the thought just occurred to me, should there be a professor who at some point in time needs to make up a midterm exam, this would be an easy one to slide on there, right? Just to see who showed up for class. That would be pretty wicked. Don't know who do that, but hey. <laughs> yeah, there is no solution for this problem. Yeah, that. Shall we take a look at it together and see if we can come up with a solution? All right. So we're going to draw a line, and we want to draw a line that goes like this, because we take care of three circles from that. All right. So that's one line. Now here it comes. You ready for it? Breakthrough thought. Second line. All right. Third line. But wait a minute. Going outside of the square. Can you do that? Well, turns out, yes, you can. And fourth one. Oop, there we go. That's all there is to it. But what you have to be able to do to solve this problem, if you have to understand, you don't have to stay inside the square. So you can draw nice big long lines that do other things. Metaphor. I'm sure it's a metaphor for life, but who cares? This is just one line enough. But the concept is, is that's what we want you to be thinking about. When it comes time, come up with solutions for design. You know, when you're coming up with concepts, ideas, that's the kind of thinking we want to make. I hate to say it because it's a terribly overused phrase, but we, this is out of the box thinking. <laughs> what else we got here? Uh, engineers and solutions. So what's the problem with engineers? I think somebody actually said the phrase a little while ago, tunnel vision, right? If I present a problem to you, you'll spend a moment or two thinking about it. Hopefully, you'll come up with at least one potential solution. And then what does your brain do? It shuts down, doesn't it? You've got a solution. Congratulations, I'm done with that. I've got other things to start thinking about, right? We think up solutions, and then we lock on to them like the jaws of life, and we do not let go because we've solved the problem. What we need to be able to do is to step beyond that and understand, yeah, yeah, congratulations, you came up with a solution. Now put that solution aside, come up with a second solution, and a third solution, and a fourth solution. And ultimately what you're going to want to do is compare those solutions and see which one's best. The very first solution that you come up with is not necessarily the best solution, is it? Okay? What really should you be doing? You should be taking a look at different concepts. Remember, you've got to have multiple concepts before you can take a look at them. You have to learn to critically evaluate them. This is also tough. You know why? Because they're your ideas. They must be the best ideas that have ever been thought of, right? Because who came up with them? You did, right? Oh my god, this is a fantastic idea because it's my idea. How could I possibly reject one of my ideas? Because <laughs> it's mine, right? But ultimately, you've got to figure out which one, of your, which one of your... Look, they're all good ideas. Congratulations. But one of them is better than the other one. You have to be able to come up with a process to evaluate them. You also have to be able to defend the reason that you select a particular solution. So if you come up with four ideas, you evaluate them, you say, this is the best one, great. That's a conversation that's gone on in your head back and forth with yourself. If you're part of a design team, if you're working for a company, if you're part of a department, eventually you're going to present that design to other people, right? And those people aren't nearly as nice as you or your mother is. They're going to say, why? Why did you choose that design? You know, I can think of other designs. Why did you pick that particular one to go with? And they're going to come after you with sharp, pointy things. So that's fine. That's the way the world works. Let's just make sure that you have the ability to defend the decision that you come up with. All right. So if you're going to create solutions, what do you need? You need two things. You need creativity and judgment. And if you've got half of these, congratulations. That's going to do you absolutely no good. Okay. Creativity is how you come up with those new concepts. We love creativity. We celebrate creativity. Creativity is like those movies and those iPods. And that's where all that beautiful, wonderful stuff comes from. But that's only half of the equation. Because you can come up with great things that are going to go absolutely nowhere. You can come up with great ideas for lousy products, lousy designs. You also need to have judgment. Okay? And that's the ability to evaluate and select the best solution. So come up with a hundred fantastic ideas. 
but also have the ability to look at those 100 fantastic ideas and pick out the one or the two that are really the best to be able to move forward with. These two skills together turn you into somebody who's actually a valuable technical professional. If you have half of them, your value goes down exponentially. All right. Oh, hey, let's do another problem, shall we? All right, this is a classic one. This is the seven bridges of the bonus <coughs> word. So here you go. You've got an island here, and I think this also might have been an island, but you've got seven bridges. And what the problem says is, hmm, they have this, these bridges forever. And then somebody asked the problem, and it bugged everybody. They said, I'd like to go on a walk. Is it possible for me to go on a walk where I cross over every bridge once? Seems like a simple one. There's only seven bridges. So what do you guys think? How would I do that? How would I go on a walk? Where would I have to start? And where would I end up if I wanted to go on a walk that would go over each bridge once? I don't know about you can't go over a bridge halfway and turn back. <laughs> really? Look, I'm stepping you up. We had four lines. We did fairly good on that, I guess. Now we're up to seven bridges. Can't be that hard. Can you swim? Cannot swim. They're sharks. So and you can't say you can yeah. go over a bridge mm -hmm. twice. Yeah, you can say you can go over yeah. only one, all over one side. Thank goodness I wrote it down, but yes, that is correct. Now remember, you're walking. No, so there's, that's a, that's a, you can start on an island, or you can start on the land, or you can start on the other island. <coughs> you start in the water. You cannot turn water. You have to go yeah. back up where you start. Nope. Uh, yeah. Don't you even care where you end up. You can start where you want. What's that? We get a larger view of the city? No. Right. But you can whip out a pencil and get at it, though. <laughs> Not that hard. Only seven bridges. That's all there is to it. I mean, this is a classic problem. It's been around for like hundreds of years. Thoughts? Solutions? Come on. Where should I start? On the island. Okay, so we'll start on the island. Cool. Where should I go first? Up, north, south, or I guess east. All right, so we're over here. Woohoo! Now where are we going to go? It doesn't matter that much, but you tell me. Should I go north or south? North. North. Woo! All right, good. Now I'm back over here. So i got sort of two options here. Which one am I going to take? Left. Left. There's one. All right, woo! back on the island. Now where am I going to go? That was a fight. The bridge was probably a little bit of 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 no. What's this? That's pretty sad. But the good news for you guys is there's no solution to the problem. Yeah, okay, and actually a uh, little gentleman that you may have heard of before, uh, Euler. Remember him? Funny strange flash name. Was actually the guy who uh, took a study of this and he came up with basically graph theory because of it. <laughs> so the, the gist of it is, is basically what happens is it's just, even, even in odd numbers, it's never going to work out. Basically, because you got it goes in and goes out, because you got the islands, it's not going to work out. So you cannot take a path, uh, stroll, and go over each one of those bridges once. Uh, primarily because getting it on is a huge thing. What it is, <coughs> is uh, you need to have an even number on the island and turn that guy an odd number. That screws everything up. Why did they send a study that's because they have just built another bridge? No, they could have. That's right, a pontoon bridge or something like that. Hey, look, it all works out. All right. So not all problems have solutions, but you know, you gotta spend time coming up with the concepts. You gotta spend the time coming up with the possibilities before you could actually reach that. But that's a key key conclusion that you gotta reach. Alright. Well that's absolutely fascinating. I wonder how that hit that happened. I disagree. <laughs> it's not equal. And I think that's actually something important that you need to take away from it. I have an absolute nice way to I did get a little, little time yeah, right here. Back here. You have to <laughs> All right, you look at this. I want you to see innovation on this side. And over here, I want you to see creativity. I want you to understand that innovation is not the same as creativity. Now, creativity has to do with creating new ideas, right? That's why it's represented apparently by a small green triangle. Okay? Innovation is the ability to bring those creative ideas to reality. Exactly how it was over there. Fascinating. 
Okay. Now, innovation is valued by companies because ultimately they need to have more products. They need to be able to bring new things out. At the same point in time, creativity is also valued, right? You know, because the ability to bring up new things. But if you don't have both of them, you're not actually going to be able to bring anything to the market. You guys ready for one more mental teaser in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> the whole bridge thing didn't work out that well. Let's do this one This one's a lot easier. Once again, if you've seen it before, shut up. If you haven't, let's see what we can do here. So here you go. I've got a little shovel. The little shovel has a little coin on it. Move two of the lines and make sure that it's still a shovel, but make sure the coin is not on it. It's not on it? It is not on it. Just two lines. Just move two lines. How much do you have to move the lines? You can do whatever you want on that one. So technically, you can take the two upright looking ones and move them like But it still has to be a shovel. You can just go, just like, sprint it in a little. Just a little shovel. That's like one of those post hole ones. Think bigger. Great concept. Let's see what your next one is. Ideas? Ideas? In the back, sir. Yeah, take the bottom two and put it on the top. Take the bottom two, these two, and put it on the top. So that one to there? Yeah. Well, great. You flip the shovel. <laughs> the coin's still on the shelf. It is upside down. Take the middle, the horizontal line, slide it over. There you go, like right there. All the way over, or just halfway? Uh, halfway. Okay. And then you take the um the line on the top left and move it to the bottom right. right. The bottom right. It's like over here. Right. So basically, I flip the shovel upside down. Right. Basically. That is exactly correct. Everybody got what happened there? You take the bottom line, move it over half. Google. Take this one, move it over there. Not basically, you have upside down. You Google. Yeah, it's a classic. Not that hard. How was that right? Is that what I said right? Because what you were doing was just what, like, two over here, right? No. <laughs> Take them and just move them in. Like you're just making it a narrower shovel. Yeah, but well, narrow shovel doesn't do it because I want the coin off the shovel. But it's still a uh, shovel. Uh, it's not. Uh, this shovel's point of objective is to move two lines, so the coin, coin is no longer in the spade. Yeah. 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 It's a crude spade, I'll admit that. All right. So what are the barriers to creativity? What's going to keep you from being as creative as we know that you can be? Well, a bunch of things. <laughs> One of the things that keeps you from being creative is something called a perceptual block. Okay? And a perceptual block is when you can't see a problem for what it really is. You've got other things going on upstairs. But you're gonna, well, generally what happens is you end up putting constraints on a problem, limitations on a problem that don't actually exist. Okay? You're basically adding to the statement of the problem. You're adding things that are not part of the problem. And we do it all the time for whatever reason. We look at something and go, well, it can't do that. It can't go that high. It can't go that fast. It can't use that much power. And those aren't actually really constraints on the system. Another perceptual block is that what happens is you've solved a problem like this in the past. You used a microcontroller or something like that. Which means that every time in the future when you see another problem like that, you're going to be thinking, I should solve it the same way. Right? We've all done that before. <laughs> when you have a, a power saw, every problem looks like it can be solved with a power saw. Right? That's sort of the gist there. Emotional blocks. We all have emotional problems, and apparently it's going to cause us some problems when we're doing our designs. Okay? The number one emotional block among all engineers is fear of failure, right? <laughs> I think it's a separate issue. You may not have a fear of ethics, but you definitely do have a fear of failure, right? Hey, here's a huge, nasty design. Could you have it done for me by tomorrow? <laughs> oh, God. Really? No. And if you don't have it done on time, you're fired. Okay, I've got some fear of failure. Thank you very much. Uh, another emotional block, um, chaos. Designing solutions or coming up with designs or coming up with concepts is a nasty, messy process. You know, it's not a nice linear process where you start here, go here, finish here. You go in circles, you go back, you come up with ideas, you reject them, you go back to the beginning. Two hours in, suddenly you're back at the, where you started and that two hours was completely wasted, basically, time period. As engineers, we hate that. That sucks. We're very linear. Start here, go here, finish here, poof, we're done. We love that. Okay? But that's not really the way the design process works, is it? It takes its own sweet time, it's going to take its own sweet path, and we're really sort of just along for the ride, is the way that one sort of works. Okay? Environmental blocks. 
things in our environment that limit our creativity. If you're working as part of a team, if you're on a lousy team, guess what? That's an environmental block, okay? That's going to hold you back. Uh, poor management. If you've got poor manager, if you've got a manager that's giving you uh, partial information or flat out wrong information or isn't giving you funding or all those sorts of things, those can make your job that much tougher. Congratulations. It's a rough job, but now it's become a lot harder. And intellectual blocks, do you know what you need to know to come up with the design? You know, if you're creating a power system, have you had the power course? <laughs> that would be sort of handy. Otherwise, you're doing some serious Googling on how to design power systems, all right? Okay? Or if you're using some sort of materials or some sort of standards or technologies that you're just not familiar with, you're going to struggle to actually come up with a solution for it because you don't know what you need to know in order to be able to put it together. So these are four things that can actually hold you back as you try to come up with your creative concepts for it. Vertical and lateral thinking. Okay, so here you go. I'm going to test your brains here, okay? Show me how smart you are. So we, as engineers, enjoy, what do we enjoy? We enjoy vertical thinking, okay? Taking a problem and proceeding logically to a conclusion. So in order to come up with good designs, we need to be able to think laterally. So let's take a look at this. Here's an example of lateral thinking. Man walks into a bar and asks the barman for a glass of water. The barman pulls out a gun, points it at the man. The man says, thank you, and walks out. What just happened? Who said that? Now, did you? Who said it? I didn't say it. It was more It was obviously him. It was, okay, so what do you say? <laughs> Have you heard this one before? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Good one. All right, well, then we'll move on to the next one. I didn't say it. So. Now, do you understand what happened there? No. 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 Oh, okay, I apologize. That was going too fast. All right, so let's go back to the man walking forward and ask our man for a glass of water. Our man pulls out a gun, points at the man, the man says thank you, and walks out. The correct answer to this one is when the man said hello, the barman heard that he had the hiccups. So he whipped out the gun to startle him or shock him. It worked. The hiccups went away. The man said thank you, and he left the bar. Got it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. If you know the answer to the next one, shut up. <laughs> All right. The man who hung himself. Not far from Madrid, there's a large wooden barn. The barn is completely empty, except for a dead man hanging from the middle of a central rafter. The rope around his neck is 10 feet long, and his feet are 3 feet above the ground. The nearest wall is 20 feet away from the man. It is not possible to climb up the walls or along the rafters. The man hung himself. How did he do it? Clockwise. What do you think? Can you think of another way he could do it? Right. Yeah, just climb up and jump. Anything else? Anything else? He had his friend take the ladder. He had his friend take the ladder. He used a cherry picker or whatever the other truck we were talking about. Alright, alright, alright. We'll do it like that. It's only three feet. That's something. There's another one. A man's lying dead in a field. Next to him, there is an unopened package. There is no other creature in the field. How did he die? He or she didn't open. Did <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Right, I got one more for you. This one, I apologize. This one stumped me. I had to go to Mrs. Anderson to get the actual solution to this one. There's a man who lives on the 10th floor in an apartment. Every morning, he goes to the elevator and goes down to the lobby and leaves and goes to work. When he comes back, he takes the elevator up to the seventh floor and walks up three flights to his apartment. He does not enjoy walking. Why does he do this? If you know it, shut up. <laughs> the rest of you think about it. His parachute didn't open. <laughs> There's a block of ice involved too, but we'll get back to that a little bit later on. Okay? So he lives on the 10th floor, takes the elevator down in the morning. When he comes back home, he takes the elevator up to the 7th floor, walks three flights up to his apartment. He does not enjoy walking upstairs. Why does he do this? <laughs> What's even worse is I knew the answer to this, and it still didn't make sense to me, and that's why I needed to have it explained to me. But I, now I can put myself as, off as being very smart. <laughs> Can I give you one more hint? On rainy days, when he comes home, he takes the elevator up to the 10th floor. Really? He's an umbrella. He oh. likes being outside. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> 
Going once. Going twice. Hey, you know, That's how I felt. And I even knew the answer. Did it make sense for you? The answer to this one is the man is a dwarf. A little person. He cannot reach the ten button. He can only reach up. Uh, <laughs> wow. See, now here's the scoop. I knew I found out the answer was he was a dwarf, and I'm like, well, I don't get it. Out of the rainy days, he's got an umbrella. He uses the umbrella to hit the ten button. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Oh, well, that's obvious. I would have had that eventually. <laughs> you know, in reality, it was just very slick. <laughs> this is called lateral thinking. The idea of behind lateral thinking is to give you a chance to identify creative solutions to problems. It's not concerned with developing the solution to the problem, or even a right or wrong solution. It's really trying to encourage you to jump around, as hopefully your brain did on that last one. Well, now, like this, how, how? Okay, vertical thinker says, you know, traditional engineers say, I know what I'm looking for, okay? A lateral thinker says, I don't know what I'm looking for, but I will know it when I find it. The answer for the list I'm sorry, it's, what, for this one? Yeah, I'm for the man lying. So. Oh, I'm sorry. The man is lying dead in the field. Next to him, there's an unopened package. There's no other creature in the field. How did he die? And the answer to that is, he uh, jumped out of an airplane, and his parachute did not open, and the package laying next to him is his parachute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, How about the other one? The virgin <laughs> himself. The man who hung himself, the answer to that one is, he uh, stood on a block of ice. <laughs> He's dead, the block of ice is melted, it's gone. <laughs> What's that? How did you get on top of the block of ice? How did he get the block of ice? How did he get on top of the block of ice? <laughs> 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 he had actually, he had a circular staircase made out of ice. It was an absolute But it's all gone now, so yeah. He did, he did. He, did. he had actually a whole crew. So, as creative as you are today, and I know you're very proud of how creative you are, you can always become more creative. The question is how? How, how can I become more creative? And why should I bother? Well, you should bother because the more creative you are, the better types of uh, designs you're going to be able to come up with. So one thing you can do is always have a questioning attitude. Don't assume that you know everything. Assume that there's things that you don't know and ask a whole bunch of questions. By doing that, you'll be able to gather information that you didn't have before and be able to lead to new types of designs and new types of concepts. Practice being creative. You know, actually spend time doing it. It doesn't have to be focused on the engineering type of design problems you're working on. You do a lot of other things in your life. You know, work on developing your creativity in the other areas, and what happens is it comes back and it spills over into all the other parts of your life. Suspend your judgment. Oh, I know the answer. Well, look at lives. Okay. <laughs> put that off to the side. Yeah, you might be right. But go ahead and take that, put it off to the side, and see if you can come up with another solution. Maybe a better solution will come from it. Uh, give yourself some time. I know nobody in this particular room would put off a project until the last minute or even perhaps the night before. But if you do that, you'll have less time to be creative. You'll have less time to come up with great ideas. If you give yourself more time, you can be more creative. You can come up with more ideas. And finally, think like a beginner. You know, whenever we start something, whenever we encounter something new, we have sort of a questioning attitude. We have an understanding that says, listen, this is a learning experience for me. Let me listen to others, let me you know, read up on it, let me do a little bit of research and become smarter for it. If we always have that attitude, no matter how much we know about a particular topic, then all of a sudden we can always gather new information, new information is going to make us more creative. Uh, there's a process called Scamper, which is just cool because it's got a cool name to it, right? But it's all about concept generations. And what it says is basically there's a lot of different ways to think about this. The first one is take a look at potentially an existing design and ask yourself the following question. Can, can we do something to, as far as the substitution? Can new elements be substituted for those that already exist in the system? So if there's an existing solution, that's great. But if your challenge, if your requirement is to come up with a better solution, take a look at what exists and say, listen, can we take something out? Can we maybe substitute something, a softer phone for a smaller phone? 
can we, uh, the second one is combine. And the question there is, can existing parts be combined in some sort of novel way that nobody has ever done before? Okay. Third one is adapt. Can parts of the whole be adapted to operate differently? Modify is, can part of the system be modified? For example, a shape or size or functionality. Anybody ever remember those Razer cell phones? The Motorola Razer phones? Uh, yeah, it's well, well, <laughs> what were so cool about those when they first came out? They were really thin, weren't they? Now, were they all that good of a phone? No. no. They really weren't. But man, they looked sexy, didn't they? I mean, they were like way for thin. And so about, for about a year or so, those were just the coolest thing going, man. Yes. All right, question. Put to another use. Are there other application domains where a product or a system can be used, put to use? And I hate to say it, but I watched the movie. What movie did I watch last night? Uh, <coughs> Source Code. Have you seen that movie, Source Code? Sweet. Yes. It's an okay movie. Not sure about. But there's a bomb in it, and they're using cell phones to trigger the bomb. And I don't know if that's really the best example, but you know, if you're in business of doing bombs, apparently cell phones are a fantastic triggering mechanism. So I don't know if that's really the best example to put to other use, but apparently that's at least one of them. Uh, eliminate. So here's an interesting part. Can parts of the whole be eliminated, or should the whole thing just be eliminated? Yeah, interesting question. If your boss came to you and said, listen, I, we need to get the next best typewriter out in about a month. Could you get up on it and start coming up with the right design for it? There's an interesting question about whether or not the world currently needs a new typewriter, right? That's sort of that step back and like, I'm not sure if this is actually necessary to do. It's a painful decision to make, but it's actually something that's fairly important to do. And then the last one is rearrange or uh, reverse. And it's interesting, just sort of changing things up. Would it actually make things better? It's different from substituting in so much that the elements of the system are not changed, but they're rearranged or ordered differently to create something new. All right, so which leads to an interesting design tool for you. We call it the concept table. So if we were talking about a personal computer system, we could probably break it up into sort of like five major categories of components that come together. You need to have a user interface, you need to have a display, you gotta be able to hook into the outside world, you need some source of power, and then there's a the question of how big the things should be, right? So forget about actually trying to design it and just spend a little bit of time thinking up different solutions. So let's just take over here. The user interface, keyboard, touchpad, handwriting recognition, video, voice. Those are all valid ways to get input into the thing, right? Eh, some are good, some are bad, whatever. You know, they're all just different ways to do the same thing. And you go through and you do the same thing on each one of these other categories. Fantastic. I've got like a master list of different ways I can put together a personal computer. Fantastic. Now the whole concept behind the concept table is you sit there and you go, huh, you know, what's been done? Well, a keyboard and a CRT, let's say serial parallel, and let's see, battery, and uh, notebook size. I mean, I can go out to Best Buy today and get that, right? That, that's what it well, is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That, that would actually be able to check you, would it? Um, that panel. Okay, so we're all good with that. So the concept for you is if you're challenged, if you're working for a company that wants to come out with an innovative new personal computer, the question is, is how can you combine these things in a way that hasn't been done before? Whoa, voice input would be interesting. Heads up display is just cool. <laughs> That's just neat. Uh, every single interface known to man, and then of course, you know, using fuel cells to power it and make it credit card size. Rock and roll! Does the world need that? Don't know, don't care. But that's at least a concept, right? So you get the idea here. You can lay out all the different ways to do it, and then if you can combine it in a different way. And you can almost take a step back, what, maybe five years, ten years? When did the first iPods come out? Ten years ago? They said we're all going to feel really old. I put an iPod. Uh, iPod. Alright, so while uh, but you can imagine if they were sitting there and they said, listen, I would like to have a music player, and they laid it out, you know, what would they say? They'd say must play cassettes, must play CDs, must play digital music, you know, must be the size of a radio, must be size of you know Walkman, must be size of what, credit card? You know, ching 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 ching. And you could see how they could actually pick out the different components and come up with actually the description of an iPod. So this is a very powerful tool. What else do we have? Oh, 
the concept fan, same concept, just sort of a different presentation technique associated with it. And this is for what, a thermal meter? So that's ultimately what you want to do. There's actually three major subsystems here. It's a sensor, it's a temperature, it's a voltage converter, and a display. Out of each one of these, you're going to have actually three design decisions that you're going to make, so different ways to do it. Uh, off amp, you've got non-inverting and inverting, so you're going to have to choose which one you want to have there. Display is obviously analog LED, LCD, or seven segment LED. Basically, these are the ones that you have to make decisions depending on where you choose here, you make a different product. Ching, 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 ching. So just a different way of representing the same sort of thing. So where the creativity comes is you actually list out all the different ways to do it, then you take it to the basic sort of the judgment stage, right? Where you pick one solution among each one of those, and that is actually the design that you have to go forward with. Right? When you do it this way, you get a chance to see the big picture. These are all the different ways I can do this. When you start to select the individual components, that's when you're actually creating your little design. Okay, great. So there you are. You've come up with all these fantastic designs, and they're fantastic designs. Why? Because they're yours. And you're the smartest person out there. Thank you very much. Okay? But now comes the painful time where you have to say, listen, only one of these designs do I have time, energy, and the cash to go forward with. So I need to figure out which one I'm going to go with. So how do you do that? Well, basically you need to use three inputs. What does your end user, whoever, teacher, class, team, whoever that is, uh, what do they want? You take all your solution concepts, and then you also take your engineering considerations. You might have some fantastic ideas, but they might be just simply too hard to put together. Okay? The goal is going to be to rank the concepts against each other. Now on a lot of these ranking systems, we like to put numbers technical professionals. Don't get fooled by those numbers. Well, it's a 13 and that's a 12, so obviously 13 is a little bit better. Because remember, you're making all this stuff up, right? Whatever you do to get numbers, there's a judgment call involved in there. So don't get carried away with the number stuff. It may point you in a direction, but don't treat it as gospel. All right, concept evaluation, step one. You've got to do your initial evaluation. You, what you do is you sit down and you lay all of your concepts out on the table in front of you. And you spend just a moment thinking about how really smart you are. Because look, there's a lot of concepts there. You did all that. Congratulations. And then you do the hard one. You, do, you discard the ones that are infeasible. They're going to cost too much. It's going to take too long to develop. It involves too much risk. That fuel cell is very cool. <laughs> but they don't exist yet, so don't use it in your solution. And a whole bunch of other things. So what you're doing right off the bat is you're saying, look, I have a bunch of great ideas. But some of these are just not practical ideas. they got to hit the trash can. Appreciate it. Love you very much. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay? Then we move on to step two. Okay, this is strengths and weaknesses analysis. So you're taking a look. You say, look, there's two different ways I can do input devices. I can do a keyboard. I can do a touch screen. Keyboards, proven technology. I can get a keyboard anywhere, right? And it's dirt cheap, rock and roll. Weaknesses that can fail over time. And by the way, I may have to come up with a whole bunch of different software drivers to actually hook it into something. Touch screen, uh, competition's using it, uh, it eliminates the source of product failures. Hard for a touch screen to fail. It's more expensive and it makes uh, the glass more brittle to embed the mesh into it. So back and forth, back and forth, you're starting to evaluate you know, a bunch of trade-offs here. Ultimately, you figure out which one's more important for you and you go forward on that. Um, this works for things of moderate complexity. If you've got a lot of different comparisons, this is going to get crazy really quickly. And there's a couple drawbacks to it. It doesn't really have a uniform criteria, right? This is all sort of gut feel stuff that you're going on. It's not really a quantitative. It's more qualitative type of stuff. But look, it has a chance to get you in the right direction. So it's a useful tool under the right circumstances. All right, we love this kind of stuff. Concept evaluation stuff too, a decision matrix. And we've seen this before, haven't we? I think we saw something like this a little while ago. Come with your criteria. So step one, determine your criteria, whatever it is. Number two, figure out whatever your weighting factors are. Then you actually come up with the design ratings, add them all up. This time I check my math, so I know that they all added up correctly. And then basically, clearly 13 is better than 10, so this is the one that you've got to go with, right? But what did we say about numbers? You can't trust them, right? You made up that criteria, you made up what the ranking thing was. This shows you that concept number two seems to have some stuff going for it. Okay? You've got one and three are sort of in position number two, so that shows you a way forward. Okay? But you really need to spend some time figuring out whether or not that's true. Okay? It's great to have more information, but don't treat this as 
suddenly there's a light from on top that shine that concept too, so that's what you have to do. Oh, team project, second deliverable. Yay! Thank you for the opportunity to work together as a team. I appreciate that opportunity. You're welcome. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I have uploaded onto the Blackboard system additional information about your product, or whatever, project, or whatever. Or maybe I just put up the same information I gave you last time. I think in one case, unfortunately, I think I did do that. What I want you to do now is to create three workable concepts for solving the problem. So now I'm actually asking for concepts. Last time I didn't care about concepts. Now I care about <coughs> concepts. And they have to be, let's see, workable concepts, OK? You're going to have an in-class presentation of how you created your concepts. The angry, bitter confrontation that went on in your team to actually come up with three concepts. <laughs> what the three concepts are and how you think they would solve the problem. All right? And then I also want an explanation of the evaluation of your concepts and a selection of which one your team thinks is best, which is what we spent all day today talking about. Right? And oh, by the way, whoever is presenting this must not have presented before. Not the high school prank and not part one. And hopefully what we learned from last time, was it Team New Jersey? Who was uh, Miss Lee? Was on which team? Which one? Virginia. Virginia. When they were having a small panic before she showed up. You might want to have a backup person to do the presentation just in case there's a tragic, you know, those satellites keep tumbling to Earth and you just know where they're going to land and that's what you are, right? Um, okay, once again, nothing to turn in. It all depends on your presentation. Once again, we will vote on the best one because that's just fun to do. And notice what I've done here, a little subtlety. I flipped the presentation order. So those that went on Tuesday last time will now go on Thursday. Those that went on Thursday will now go on Tuesday. Is this still a competition where it's 50% and you can kind of The competition is, yes, the team, the class gets to vote. It's not like 50%. But yes, you get additional points if the class likes your presentation the best. Are there any questions? And by the way, all of the additional information has already been uploaded to Blackboard if I did our setup. That understood? C. Fantastic. Ooh. Hey! It's your capstone. Should we spend just a moment talking about it? Well, what the heck? So, the way this story starts is this weekend I happened to be in the pawn shop, which is actually sort of interesting for me. The reason I was in the pawn shop is because, number one, I'm an engineer, and that means that I am cheap, right? Right? Because we're all cheap, right? And so, in my particular family situation, we decided that we needed another TV. And the wife has been watching those, what, TLC shows? What is it? Pawn Star. Pawn Star, whatever. And so I'm looking online at Costco and Walmart and stuff like that. And she said, you know, I bet you could go to a pawn store and get a cheap TV. Notice she didn't say, I'm going to go to a pawn store and get a TV. She said, I bet you could go to a pawn store. So the very first value pawn store that I went to didn't seem to be in that sort of hey, let's negotiate mode. <laughs> but what's good is the second store that I went to was actually in a negotiating mode. And they had a lot of TVs, man. So, you want to know what I got? I don't know. Yes. Yes. Would, you, would you like, because you could do the same thing. Would you be interested? You have no money, but you know, someday you might have money. Would that be sort of cool? <laughs> <laughs> got a 42-inch ProScan TV for $330. You know how big that is? I mean, it's monstrous. It's huge. And it was listed at three ninety nine. so I talked it down, so I don't want to brag or anything like that, but that was <laughs> But anyway, so I got this monstrous TV home. And what I had to do was hook in the kid's Wii system, right? Now, the Wii has like one of those yellow cables. You know what I'm talking about? You know, the yellow video cable coming out of it? And I went to the back of this thing. And it had what was a YPRPB connection. Are you familiar with that? So yeah, a component. And I guess what I had was a composite. So it was a composite to component type of thing. Nobody makes a composite to component adapter in the Tampa Bay area. Not really. Attractive, I did go to a Radio Shack and I bought what I thought 
was a multiple input to multiple output type of thing, but unfortunately it takes component and puts out component, it takes composite, puts out composite. I don't know. Yeah. It gets confusing. <laughs> but Mrs. Anderson was spending a lot of car time going from store to store to store until she bumped into the guy from Radio Shack that said, I've never heard of a TU that did not have a component input. And I thought to myself, well, that's odd because that does seem like it should have it. And it, the TV has this, you know, like five inch set of jacks on the side, on the left hand side. I said, I wonder if there's some additional jacks. And I took a look. There's another five inch set of input jacks on the bottom. <laughs> really? On the bottom. It's not plugged in and everything was very good. But I want to share with you a thought. You know, video conversion. There's a lot of different signals out there, right? In my particular case, it was composite to component, right? But there's also composite to HDMI and HDMI to component and all sorts of interesting things. So if you're still sort of kicking around what's going to be the capstone project that's going to make you the happiest, I want to present to you the concept of video conversion. I don't know. It's at least something to throw out there. I don't know what you convert from or to or what have you. But it's at least something to ponder, maybe a little bit. Because I can tell you this weekend, I was in the mood to buy this particular product before I figured out what the real solution was. <laughs> All right, so where are we with your capstone? We have your pick a project taken care of. And remember, you can keep changing your mind. I think a lot of people change their mind on the second turn in. Fantastic. Keep changing. Okay? You have no commitment. It's not a marriage. Goodness gracious. You need to determine your problem statement for your capstone. Excellent. Fabulous. So we're sort of at step three, which is write a description of your project. Which of course means, whoop, assignment for you due on Thursday this week. <laughs> it's not that freaking hard. It's okay. What do you got to do? You got to write a description for the capstone project that you've already selected. By the way, if you're not happy with your project, select a new one. Okay? I don't care what you turned in for homework one or homework number two. Okay? If you're not happy with it, if it's just not jelly for you, if you're just not that interested, pick a new one. That's completely okay. You can always change your capstone project. That's what's so cool about this class. You don't have to have commitment. If you've got fear of commitment, this is where you need to be. This is fantastic. Okay, now what are, why are we doing this description? Here you go. This is the key. The description is intended to be sent to your e department professor mentor before you meet with them. Not like you're going to show up in the office and go, hi, this is what I'm thinking. This is how you start the conversation. You send this description to them and say, I would like to set up a meeting to discuss this further with you. So they already know what you're thinking before you show up. So you have an audience that you're writing this description for. It's not me. It's that professor who doesn't know you and doesn't know anything about your capstone project that you're thinking about doing. Okay? Got the context here? What problem is your capstone project solving? And what's in it for them? Aha. You're going to ask the professor to spend time with you? All right, that's cool. I mean, that's sort of part of their job. But why? What are they going to get out of it? Think about that. You're doing a sell job here. A sell job on you and your idea. And it's a new next class. Like, how how like, technical is it? Like, is it not technical at all? If, I don't think you can be that technical at this point in time, right? You have, and do you think he cares? Probably not. I mean, you got, you're up here. You've got to describe what you're doing, right? There's some interesting thoughts that if you're going to have a mentor, that mentor is going to want to share with you, is going to want to influence your design. If you showed up with a completed design and said, hey, this is what I'm doing, What's in it for him? Great, I'd love to watch you put that together. <laughs> right? That's not going to do it. So I think where you want to do is you want to focus on the, on the problem at this point in time. And you want to describe the problem in such a way that you're going to hook that professor. He's going to go, hmm, yeah, that's a good problem. You know, and I, as an electrical engineering professor, can think of about 20 different ways to solve that. I'm going to be interested in having that discussion with you to find out how you're planning on solving it. Right? So there's some interesting things that are going to go on here. Because that professor needs to have input into your design. 
There needs to be some of him or her in your final capstone project. It can't all be about you, because you want to hook them and you want to get them to that question. How does this description differ from the, it seems like we're repeating this last It does, process. sort of, right? But in this particular case, you've got somebody who doesn't know anything about you or anything about your project that you're not trying to sell them to work with you. So it's going to be similar to what you've already done, but it's also going to be a little bit different. You understand? That's hard to go figure out. All right, that's cool. <laughs> So if you're saying that you he wants you're saying to our professor who wants to know what our solution is to it, if we already put that in our description, should we take that out then? I think you probably want to pull that. Because huh? right. yeah. really what you want to do is you want to focus on the problems that you're solving. Because right? you're trying to get them interested in working with you. You know, they may still work with you even if they're not interested in working with you, but you really don't want that to happen, right? Because that's not going to be a good interaction. You're selling your idea and the challenge and the excitement about doing what you get question. If I want to get started, is it advisable for us to go ahead and try to get the best or at least close kind of way? Well, you go ahead. You can always get started. I'm going to eventually ask you to reach out and touch out and you know, get in touch with the professor and you can have a discussion with them and figure out if they're the right one. So you have a formal like, process laid out for us to do that. Sort yeah, of. I'd like to call it a formal okay. process. I'm probably going to say go, go, go contact the professor and tell me how it goes, right? Okay. Now here's the, you know, we're not necessarily to that stage yet, but when you do reach out to a professor, just a real quick question. You think you're going to pick the right professor right off the bat? Yeah. Well, of course. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a technical professional. Do you think it's possible you might choose the wrong professor right off the bat? Maybe I should phrase it that way. It's possible, right? You might have that initial meeting with them, and you might go, wow, I really don't get along with that person. I had a great idea. And he sat there the whole time going, your idea sucks. <laughs> You're really going to spend your time doing that? I don't really understand why. I think it's been done before, right? If you don't get the kind of enthusiastic support that you're hoping for, give up, drop out, join business school, <laughs> or maybe pick another professor, right? I mean, ideally, when you're talking about selecting a mentor, you're interviewing the professors. I mean, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but. You can really only have one professor work with you, right? So you're making a selection of who you'd like to work with. If this is an ideal world, you'd really talk to three of them, right? And then pick from those three and say, okay, this is one that I think I'm, I'm most compatible with and my project is most compatible with. It's at least an interesting concept, right? But this description is how things start. Because this is how you're going to communicate to whoever you're going to talk to what the heck you're doing. This is similar to what you've done, but it is a little bit different. You have a different audience for it. Are there any questions here? Are we shooting for like a paragraph or a? We're talking about probably eventually this is going to be like an email, so it can't be that long, right? Yeah. So just think of it as like no longer than a screen of information. That sound cool? Because is he going to read it anything longer? He or she going to read anything longer than that? What's the resolution on the screen? Yeah. <laughs> we're doing like six point type. You know, it's a standard. <laughs> All right. We're good. Yeah. And this one is due on Thursday. And the question is, why would they want to work? Okay? You need to be asking this. So far you've been thinking about the project in terms of you, you, you. And if nothing else, this is where things start to change up a little bit. You start to think about why would somebody else want to work with me to solve this particular problem. Okay? All right, a little bit about ethics. This woman who was in the news a little while ago, this lady by the name of Danielle Chesky. Ch Casey? I'm not sure. But anyway, she's a former beauty queen, queen so they say, a uh, turnstile trader. <laughs> she has an opportunity to spend a little bit over a year in jail. And the reason is because she passed on insider information to uh, her married boss and lover, uh, another gentleman who's also going off to jail. So all sorts of people get to go to jail because they traded in information that was not publicly available. So you would prefer, first off, not to look like her, and number two, not to go to where she's going to be spending the next year. So we should probably spend just a moment talking about ethics, shall we? Now this one is one that's actually probably going to show up, or has a good chance of showing up in your actual life. So let's talk about what the situation is. You're working for a company, they've got a records retention policy. By the way, what is a records retention policy? Keep records. Keep records, but that's half of it. Do you keep records forever? Tells you which ones to destroy and which ones so you destroy records yeah, yeah. That's at a certain point. At a certain point. Now, how would you know when you should destroy it? 
Is there criminal activity in here? I know. <laughs> Start shredding now. <laughs> There's uh, some former employees of, what was it, Accenture Consulting who uh, hit the street because they were doing some shredding. Right, so the concept is, is most companies have a records retention policy that says, when we work on a project, we will hold on to all the information for a certain period of time. Generally, how long they hold on to it is based on legal requirements. What's very interesting is companies are very interested in you getting rid of those records as soon as you possibly can. So when the retention period is up, they're very, very excited about you actually throwing those records away. They don't want old records hanging around because all of a sudden they're liable for them. If they don't have the records, they're not liable. If they do have the records, then if somebody does discovery, which is when the lawyers come in, they've got a liability issue. Okay, so anyway, company record retention policy instructs employees to discard development records and test results for products five years after the end of life is declared. It's in compliance with local legal stuff, so you're not doing any Accenture shredding stuff like you're not supposed to. But because of how much work you've had, you've not disposed of some old records. Bad, bad, bad. Okay? And they're a couple years over the limit for the company policy. You finally get time to clean out your files, but just then you receive legal requests for any information about the old product that's involved in the injury case. Your records may or may not be applicable to the case. Should you destroy the records? Oh, yes. <laughs> You've got the records there. You have a legal document that says you shall provide copies of all documents that you have. It depends how much money you have in the bank because you're going to lose your job. Ah. <laughs> you were supposed to get, yeah, I mean, you screwed up on this, right? So Two years ago, you were supposed to be toasted us, right? Boss came to first, so he wins. <laughs> now remember, they can call you to testify, and they can say, you know, we've been informed that you shredded some documents that would have been relevant to this case, and what would you say if they called you to testify? Shredding the <laughs> <laughs> You know, the time and date thing on the shredder is sort of awkward. <laughs> right. It sure seems like the legal situation here is pretty simple, right? But then you're going against company policy. Well, you're already going against company policy. Two years ago, you should have been toasting those papers, yeah, right? You sure, now, but you like, didn't. For the injury to the... Yeah, but do you want to go to jail? Or do you well, that's... I don't know, you have it. Well, that's, you know, brings up an interesting question. With the company, the company what? A couple different ways to go here. It looks like we've got, on one hand, keep that was job. Long ago. And on the other hand, going to jail. What's going to cause you to go to jail? If they catch you, sure. what action on your part is going to cause you to go to jail? If you do what? Destroy the documents. If you destroy the documents. It sure seems like that's going to send you to jail, right? If you don't destroy the job documents, are you going to go to jail? Yes. <laughs> no. Because you haven't done anything illegal by not destroying it, right? There's nothing illegal with that. Are you going to lose your job? Yeah. Let's say there's a possibility, right? So this one's actually pretty clear, isn't it? Or I mean, it's becoming clearer. There's a possibility of losing your job, or there's a possibility of going to jail. Which one are you going to choose? Going to jail includes losing your job. Just lose your job and get another one. But you don't know that for sure. Hey, you did such a great job of destroying those papers. <laughs> don't work so hard. Hold your you job know. for you. And then you come out. Or you know, yeah. So, so what if you accidentally just misplace the documents? <laughs> like took them home. <laughs> How good are you on the stand? <laughs> so here's the way that one goes: is they call you at the court, and they say, "So where are the papers?" And you go, uh, "I don't know where they are." Okay. And then you take that off the set, and they bring in the administrative assistant or the temp or somebody like that, and they say, "Hey, you look on Wednesday. All those papers are on his desk, right?" At which point in time. They say, wait, you said you didn't know what they were, but I wouldn't say what they were on your desk. You just do a Roger Clemens and say they miss they miss and remember. <laughs> yeah. Wait. What's the credibility of these? <laughs> Coincidentally. <laughs> that's exactly what she said. Alright, so you're in a situation where here where you actually have multiple ways you can you know do this one. But I mean I think the most important thing to understand here, one decision is gonna send you off to jail potentially, if they catch you, right? Another decision, you let's assume you will probably lose your job, right? And you really like your job. It's a good job, well-paying job, all that sort of stuff like that. You got a decision to make there. Is there a good decision to be made? No, they both suck, right? 
But the question is for you, what's the right decision? Yeah, just for a little bit. Oh, that's always a good one. All right. You're struggling with that one. So I got a question. What if your boss asks you to delete emails within a certain day? That's an interesting point. He doesn't tell you why. So, so if you get instructed to do something that you know is illegal, or is, is it illegal? I don't even know. But so here's the most important thing on that one. You need to get that instructions in writing. Right? I mean, arguably you can say, that my boss told me to do this and so I did it. Okay? But if it's a your word, his word, and you both go to trial, what's he going to say? He did what? <laughs> he deleted that? No, we have a clear document retention policy. I can't believe you went ahead and did that. He's rogue. That's what it is. You get it in writing from him, then you probably okay. okay. But also remember, if you delete it off the server, there's backup tapes for that, so they're going to get it back. All right, here we go. One more here. You've just discovered that a company in the far, uh, I'm sorry, country in the Far East has new regulations that apply to your product. The requirement is to submit a report and get a file number to apply to your product after the government department has given it's okay. However, you know from industry contacts that they're not really enforcing the law. Should you delay shipping your products until they are compliant, or should you do something else? Why not? You're going to be making like a million dollars a week when I'm shipping the product. And it could take, what, four or six weeks for this to work through its bureaucracy. And they're not even checking it. It's not a big deal. Nobody's going to get hurt. It's not being enforced. Yet. It's not being enforced. It's not like anybody's going to be hurt. Like, is, is this a, like they just don't care? Or it's like a time after they've set the regulations? It's paperwork. It's paperwork. It's, it's just paperwork. They're, they're not checking it. it. They're not checking it. It's just they got passed. It's just some sort of legislation. It's just a rubber stamp thing. Which country? <laughs> the, the friendliest country in the Far East. So what are you gonna do? You gonna ship? Or are you gonna haul off and do the right thing and run it through the paperwork? I mean, you know, if you start shipping, it's a possibility they can make you do a recall. They're good because you certainly don't have your paperwork in order, do you? Ah, she can't do it and see what happens. That works. Are you gonna pull the trigger or what? All right. You can go either way on this one, right? You got a little bit of a challenge there. This one doesn't look like it has quite the same dramatic after effects as one. You're not going to jail here. You do the wrong thing, could you lose your job? If you ship, goes into the country, the country discovers that you did it, they get ticked off, they'll make you recall all those products and then go through all the things, do you think you could lose your job? Yes. The answer is yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's expensive. And it's egg on the face for the company and all that. You, know, you show disrespect for the company's uh, regulations and stuff like that. Da, da, da. You could get kicked out of the country, right? Easily. Are you sending this product to other places at times in the future? Or is this just like a one-shot deal? Well, let's say you're out there. Let's say this is the iPad. So, for future, like, if you just hold off, get the regulations at one time, and every other time in the future when you're shipping stuff out, you'll already be in the clear. Oh, you do it the right way for everything else, just not for this one? Well, yes. I robbed the bank this time, but I've been into a lot of banks and not robbed them. No, so it's I'm okay. doing the right thing. I'm not robbing the bank. I'm doing the legal thing. Oh, okay. It depends on the repercussions of not following. Oh, that's right. Oh, uh, so, so depending on how much trouble you get in is how you make your decision for yourself. <laughs> like, I mean, like, if it's not a technical thing, I mean, if it's not hurting you later, if it's just like they want you to put this... Well, there's not a rule in place, and you'd be breaking the rule. You'd be violating the rule, right? It happens all the time. The other guys did it, so it's okay for me to do it, right? Yes. Well, it is. No clear, easy solutions, but lots of different possibilities. All right. So what did we cover today, guys? All right, so first off, we did what is creativity. We talked about how you guys can become more creative, which is going to help you in everything you do. We talked about how to generate concepts, how to evaluate concepts, because it's great to have concepts, but they're not all created equal. Congratulations, you guys got team assignment. You've got to create three concepts and do some fantastic explanation of where they came from and which one is best. That would be next week. So I think it's the week of uh, the first.
Individual assignment, create a capstone description. That's due in class on Thursday, two days from today. And we talked about some ethical issues such as when you should ship your product, which of course you guys completely failed on. What are we going to talk about next time? We're going to talk about project management, and we're going to talk about more about the ethics of shipping your product because uh, we have to come up with a better explanation than you did today. Have a great day, guys. We will talk on Thursday.